be quite. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are here at the PNCFL conference, a virtual conference 2022. And this is our session on CETA, the Slavic and East European Teachers Association of Washington. This is kind of a meetup group, a little more informal. So we were just doing some introductions. Um, I'm Michelle Ansiwaoki, and uh, I have a degree in, uh, from the Slavic department at the University of Washington. I study a lot of the languages of uh, the Balkans, the South Slavic area, as well as Romanian and also Russian, which I used for my dissertation. I taught Russian for a number of years at the university, but I never taught it in K-12. But for the last 20 plus years, I've been involved in K-12 world language education and other languages supporting Spanish, you know, Spanish, Japanese, Mandarin, French, et cetera. And now I am back and having retired from Seattle Public Schools, more involved in uh, supporting uh, languages from the Slavic and East European area. Vince, why don't you uh, again introduce yourself briefly and then also tell about your connection with Waffold. Okay, well, I'm a graduate of the University of Washington's Russian program, Slavic program, I should say, with an emphasis in Russian and Russian linguistics. I've taught in a number of Seattle area schools, um, usually on non-continuing contracts because of, for various reasons. Moved to Spokane and worked with the ESD and their satellite broadcast program that they had in the early 90s and then ended up getting my ELL endorsement and got a job teaching ELLs um, to the many um, Russian speaking immigrants in the late um, 1990s and then early 2000s, the, the diaspora that came here. Um, and then convinced the school that I was in that we should offer a Russian program. So I am a recently retired ELL slash Russian teacher, or depending upon my emphasis, Russian slash ELL um, teacher. I am the representative to the Waffle Board for CETA, and CETA is our group, as you can see on the screen, that we are here to help and support any Eastern European language um, and how we can do that, either in the you know P20 area to um, all you know in the private schools, whatever we can do to help promote um, Slavic languages in the state of Washington and even beyond. I mean, even though we are of Washington, if we've got somebody else in one of our neighboring states, then we're more than glad to help them as well. We'd like to really collaborate together. So let's go to Roseanne because you're someone who actually was in the throes of as a Russian teacher in our state uh, back in the period when there was a lot of support for teaching Russian in the schools. Well, hi everybody. I kind of feel like an old relic or something uh, <laughs> uh, coming back and, and all the years that I've been away from teaching, I just have wondered why in the world has there been this de-emphasis on Russian? Just in your wildest, you don't have to even be creative at all in your thinking to imagine that one of these days we're gonna have a problem. It, it just always happens. Then all of a sudden we have a hot language again and we have to get started all over again. I just am grateful for Vince, everything that you've said and what you and Michelle did for a presentation for today. Um, you know, I started out at the University of Washington, like just about everyone else, and uh, got a job in the Bellevue School District, and they were very progressive, uh, totally white population over there, uh, but the, uh, the good language programs probably still do today, and definitely had Russian in there very strongly, so I started my first year of teaching. I went to three high schools and started the Russian programs, and then eventually, you know, they grew to need other teachers, but the thing is, that I feel as if the, and, and I should say that in addition to that, we had a, uh, audio lingual, the, what were those materials now? I can't. The ALM, yes. The ALM, yeah. That's what I learned on, yes, yeah. in, in high school. Yeah. Right. It wasn't all that bad. It was pretty similar to the UW program, actually. And it was approved, you know, by the UW at the time. They were very happy to know that we were going and using those uh, materials. But in addition to that high school experience, I did um, on an elementary school level, uh, when I was getting my credentials again, I live in Oregon now uh, to teach. I had a job in the meantime where I was an assistant in Russian to the Russian families there. They had a target school or a, a, uh, 
uh, what do you call it, a, a school where all the kids who were from that uh, era of immigration, you know, the early a bilingual night. orientation center yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, it was the, um, there, there's a word for that, a school like that specializes in something. Like a dual language. Magnet or, or magnet program. A magnet school, that was it. Yeah, it was the magnet grade school for all the Russian speaking kids. Oh, no. so, that was a lot of fun. I went into the classrooms and just assisted the regular teacher with kids who were having any trouble understanding things. And then I also had a unique experience in that just before that in the summer, I worked with kindergartners who were from the Old Believer colony in Woodburn, mm -hmm. Oregon. Yeah. And that was quite an experience because they absolutely would not let me use any English at all. And you couldn't sing because of, you know, their religious, uh, Without singing, you, you're really missing a lot when you're trying to teach a language. I think it's a really powerful tool. But at any rate, just with regard to what is going on right now, it, it's so interesting. I heard a, I listened to a lecture just the other day by Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Posner. I think you all know who he was, the Soviet journalist, but now, you know, he's in the U.S. He's a citizen of three countries, actually very sensible guy, and he has this lecture called How the United States Created Putin. Very worthwhile listening to, because one of the things that he refers to is how when the wall came down, it was like, yippee, we're the only superpower, and we just stopped thinking about certain things. You know, we just stopped thinking about the future. What could be likely to happen? And there were a lot of things where it's, he points out very clearly exactly what kinds of things led to this tremendous anger that Vladimir Putin has right now. Uh, at any rate, I am really glad about this organization. I think it would be fun to bring back all those Russian teachers who are still alive. I'm surprised I'm still alive, uh, <laughs> who taught Russian in that era, you know, Richard Carter. And there was a, you know, there were several people who are still around. That I did my student good. teaching with Richard Carter. What's that? I did my student teaching in the mid 80s with Richard <laughs> Carter. Did you really? Yeah. No, I think at one point he, and so I served as Waffle president and also was on the National Actual Board. Um, and, you know, my whole thing was that we're not going to have anything to teach if we don't get the word out in the community. So I've always been orientated to promotion you know, getting people to know. And in Bellevue, I had to defend myself all the time about why is this important? I remember going to one Kiwanis, no, it wasn't Kiwanis. It was actually a rotary meeting, I think, in Bellevue and explaining why this was actually part of basic education, you know, to be aware of the world. Uh, so I think that we really do need to bring this Russian thing back. I think it's just a pity that it has lagged, you know, in spite of all the good efforts of those of us who are on the screen, um, it, it, it just is a necessity. And I feel the same way about all the East European languages who, you know, these are people who have been in the crossroads all the time. Look at the Balkans, you know, being trampled here. Why do we stop teaching those languages until we absolutely need them and then we have to scramble? But, you know, it's all about money, isn't it? So what can yeah, we- I mean, some of it's money, but, uh, you know, some of it's uh, awareness and all, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. which languages- but are, are important to teach at any given moment. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you and know, it's interesting. We're sort of getting this whole period of time. And then Larissa is interesting because of the time period in which you came to Washington mm -hmm. and, and your role. And I mean, what's exciting is just how much you're doing now with Russian uh, and, uh, you know, being close to its school district too, because she's involved in Bellingham School District and has taught there in the past. So uh, let, I'm sorry, Vince, I think you wanted to say something, then let's ask oh, Larissa to introduce herself. Yeah, it's not just also um, the fact that, you know, we, we have a less commonly taught language. It's like, when you see this trend towards all languages, that it's, it's the Spanish, there's fewer Spanish teachers. Um, so yeah. that means that you always see that there's openings for Spanish, there's fewer French, there's fewer, there's just seems to be this general interest in America, that languages overall aren't that important. That's so right. we're not, even though, you know, in the state of Washington, that's one of the pathways, you needed two years of a mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. um, not the only pathway, I have to remind people, but even that doesn't seem to be increasing the demand for for languages and for language teachers. Mm -hmm. so. 
Well, that's of course, right. everybody's teaching English around the world. So that is yeah. also. Sometimes so. that's the attitude. Anyway, Larissa, please introduce yourself because I think your videos also from YCRED, and I'll, I'll show her where those are, it would be extremely interesting to Lorianne if just to kind of revitalize Russian. Um, I'll tell you, I'll tell about that program in just a moment. Yes, uh, so my name is Larissa, Larissa Shuvalova. I came from, from um, Russia at that time, it was already Russia, but um, I was educated both in, in USSR and in USA. Uh, I was born in Leningrad and attended Leningrad State University. Um, I majored in Russian language and literature. Um, and then when I came to United States, I attended Western Washington University uh, Linguistics, and I uh, earned a master's in education, which really helped me um, to be an ESL teacher in the K-12 system for, gosh, I'm <laughs> scared of years now. <laughs> I'm just keep thinking, oh, now 24 plus years. Um, and yes, I was um, in a different roles, but I always worked uh, with uh, families. Uh, so I was not only the teacher, but I was kind of a, a liaison between uh, families and, um, and an educational system. And still is, and still is. Um, I'm, still work, I'm still working with different districts and helping with uh, families. And um, just thinking about all these um, interesting stories that I had. I always wanted to see the world. But it happened that uh, the world came to me um, as the stories of my students. So I do have my own story. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> um, I have my own story because I'm a child of Perestroika. So I came here living through all of this, um, you know, um, stages of a Soviet uh, childhood. Uh, and then um, living through the time of rebuilding and afterwards, too. So it's a kind of a different stories. So if you want to know more about this, yes, you can listen to another presentation that I just um, had um, this summer, I think, and it, it was 30 years since the uh, since Putsch. So um, that was kind of, I went back and thought about all of these things. I never thought that it would be so recent for the history of what's going on now. But I just wanted to say that, yes, I do uh, see the world through my own story, through stories of my uh, students who came in a various time to United States. Uh, for example, a lot of students, Slavic speaking students, they came uh, from Ukraine, from Armenia, from uh, Azerbaijan, and uh, speaking Slavic and um, Arabic languages too. Um, and through former republics. So there was a big immigration after uh, Perestroika time when um, people didn't have anywhere to move. Uh, so the Russian speaking families from all these former republics, a lot of them came here. Yeah. So, and now it's like another circle of life and I'm proud to be uh, teaching a Russian in online program uh, together with uh, Alexei Kuznetsov. And we work with um, some of the students that came from former republics and some of their, uh, their children that are grown up now and they are uh, learning more about history, more about their um, native home language, heritage language. Um, you can also attend or listen to my uh, live, not live, uh, recorded session today, uh, Raising Bilingual Children. Because yes, I raised my daughter here in two cultures. And then um, now I am on a, another circle of life uh, with, uh, with grandchildren. And not only with the grandchildren, but all the children that um, are children of my, chil my <laughs> ex-students. Uh, and I'm very proud of this that they, but they also, it's a difficult situation for them uh, when just, Vince mentioned this term adjective or hot language. Um, it, is, it has a different connotation for me working with the families. A lot of them are from mixed families. Uh, for example, father is Ukrainian and have a family there and the mother is Russian. A lot of families like this. And there's a lot of 
um, kind of understanding of the situation right now. So this topic is very, it's a very sensitive topic. So just I have to encourage everybody who is working with the Slavic students be very careful approaching this topic. There is no, of course, no avoiding that, but just have more understanding of a different perspectives too. Um, for example, people who are trying to leave the conflict zone, there are different nationalities too. And all of them experience very traumatic uh, events. And they come here and again they're from different communities from a different perspectives so i think where the teachers have to um, show the understanding and be a peacekeepers and try to uh, bring together communities i don't know i didn't i didn't get <laughs> to yeah. talk about me i just went to the hot topic as i said but i think it's very important to uh, learn about different communities and like uh, with everything that's going on um, I remember a time when my own students from Ukraine were teaching me Ukrainian and now I decided well it's time to for me to re renew that and um, I am learning now like um, officially I'm taking a course from uh, Indiana State University <laughs> with Svetlana <laughs> who offered the uh, free course and I'm taking the course every Saturday uh, to learn um, really on the Ukrainian language. Larissa, uh, I wanted to mention too, the Central Asian community in Seattle, very mixed. And we talk about mixed groups, you know, Uzbeks being married to Kazakhs or whatever combination you want to come up with. They're just having Navruz today in Seattle. And it's one of the places where these people kind of get united. But what's over all of them when you have to talk about communication, it always ends up being Russian. And so that's another area, you know, where uh, it's highly unlikely that we're going to be offering all those different languages anywhere, but uh, they still all know Russian and it is one way to serve them is to bring them into the picture too. And I have to say that I'm really surprised there's hardly any talk. I mean, I was president of Seattle Tashkent Sister City for 12 years and went over there probably six times. And I'm just surprised that Central Asia just hasn't, has hardly been mentioned right now. And yet you just think about it and think about the pressure that they must be feeling right now because they have all sorts of agreements with Russia, you know, their whole yes. economy, yes. you know, they have war mm -hmm. agreements, you know, weapons agreements and all that. And again, it just is, you know, what's the, what's the language that would have to be used if you're dealing with these people and it's Russian. Oh, yes, so many... was, uh, in a program that uh, I teach now, an online program uh, for heritage speakers of Russian, um, there was an activity when we showed on the map where the families came from. And I was surprised to see it's all over the place. Yes, um, Armenia and Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, um, Kabardino Balkaria. Uh, so uh, all these different like uh, places and do people identify themselves as a Russian ethnically? It's kind of a mix. It's kind of a mix. But they all kind of feel about themselves as a Russian speaking. And very often Russian is the language that uh, father and mother, the common language between yeah. them too. So this is a home language and uh, kind of bringing together from very, very different part. Um, so I, I do hope that the language will be a peacekeeper not the divider now because i i'm <laughs> afraid to uh, listen to the radio even to my uh, favorite stations uh, sometimes adults they don't really have an understanding what they're praising and what they're not praising right. uh, even like my favorite station i hear some things that i'm thinking oh my goodness we shouldn't praise people for divide themselves and hate in a, here in a community in a different country like United States, for example, right? We have to have more stories about uh, unification of people who live here um, rather than um, how you know they're separating themselves from each other and fighting here with each other. So I, yeah. I <laughs> it gets it gets into American politics, but truly. We're talking about preserving democracy in Ukraine. We have some real serious problems right now in the United States and they bring that up, you know? And I was just thinking about, you know, what we're, what we're seeing Putin do, but has, I haven't heard, I hope he doesn't bring it up. Hope he doesn't think of it. Uh, Sherman's March on Atlanta, 
when it was the most incredible pillage of people and killing of civilians, burning of houses and everything to save the union and President Lincoln endorsed it. So I hope nobody brings that up, but it is a, a you know, when, when we have to be careful about what we're talking about somewhere else and whether we really understand what democracy means in another place, when we have some really serious undermining of a democracy going on here right now. Anyway, it is, a, I, I hope I'm supporting your point, Larissa, which is you just can't know enough about how a given society and it, its culture works because it could be really different from what say a so-called American, if there is such a thing. Well, let's go to Lorianne. Um, because I would like to know a little bit more how we could maybe support you as you are starting out, you know, to create a Russian yeah. program. Um, like I say, when I finally got into a school where I could convince the vice principal to put it in the schedule, um, I was fortunate in that at the same year that my first class started, they had made a switch of German teachers and a whole bunch of the students who had been, you know, planning to take four years of German suddenly say, well, I don't want fourth year German with some teacher I don't know. So I ended up getting four or five young men who thought, well, I'll, I'll take Russian for a year and see how that works out for me. Um, and, and, and it helped me that first year I had a real boost. I also had to fight though, the idea that we have a number of heritage speakers and so as the eighth graders were signing up for Russian, they were all taking the idea that, oh, I don't wanna take Russian because it's filled with people who already speak Russian. Um, so there's different things that you have to think about, about how am I going to start this program? What do I need to, you know, what kind of pitfalls might there be? So if you've got some questions or if you'd like to once again, introduce yourself, um, uh, that would be great. Okay, well, I'm Lori Williams. I'm a Spanish high school. I teach in high school at Stillicum High School. Um, the principal asked me if I wanted to teach uh, Russian one next year because I'm certified in the state of Washington uh, to teach Russian. However, I haven't taught Russian in about 15 years. <laughs> so uh, I've forgotten quite a bit. Um, I really would like to take the summer to, to refresh quite a bit. Um, so if you have any suggestions, I don't need to do um, Middlebury refresher class. Um, so I, I need help there. Um, and anything as far as curriculum goes, suggested curriculum that you've used or that I can bring up to my principal, that would be good. Um, it doesn't have to be a textbook. Um, anything that you could help me with, I am ready to listen. How's that? <laughs> Well, I know that Larissa's got great ideas because that's currently what she's doing mm -hmm. um, is, is teaching Russian to, I'm gonna say heritage speakers mostly. Um, mostly, yes, but most, not only, but mostly, yes. Yeah. But you have some beginners too. I mean, they may be heritage speakers, but they're beginner, lear beginner learners of Russian. And I think we have a number of potential resources to bring to bear to help uh, kind of together with you, Lorianne, maybe come up with some ideas for things that uh, could be effective to get it started at Stillicum. Is there something recommended, uh, Michelle by, and Vince, by Actful, by... No, 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 the, no, no. I mean, nobody recommends specific like uh, textbooks or courses of study, but there are a number of resources, including an open educational resource from Portland State University that I know Svetlana is using uh, with her Edmonds Community College program. And... Um, the there's you know there's a lot of possibilities i think we should look to partner with the university of washington as well and russ hugo is here from the language learning center they support technology wise all of the uh, languages on campus and in particular they've supported the russian star talk program that we've been doing for uh, well, like 11 years now and uh, that has is oriented to heritage speakers but that doesn't mean we can't go back and look at what our best practices, we know what those are and you know what they are for Spanish as well, and think about how to bring those into uh, to design an effective Russian program. 
for you. Um, so, yes, I can, and says, can I, like, I just, yes, with, with everything uh, said, yes, that's, uh, of course, there are some resources too. But I found one, um, so I looked at different programs, and especially last year uh, for older students, for older students who are starting, um, uh, it, it, it could be beginning a heritage or uh, Russian as a foreign language. And I found uh, the best uh, program um, that I use actually now with some of the beginners, heritage students who are older, like 14 plus, not everything, but some of this um, very helpful exercise. I recommend the program that the name of it is Payekhali, and it's uh, um, actually two people from uh, St. Petersburg State University, oh. uh, uh, husband and wife, Chernyshov and Chernyshova. They develop a wonderful program. And it's very oh. up to date, um, a, a very up to date, great exercise. You have to be, if it's with students, with the younger students than adults, you, some of the exercise you might want not to, <laughs> or change or not uh, give them. But I found this is the best program that is out there right now, anywhere in the world. So they how, really, how, how do you obtain that program, Larissa? <sighs> well, uh, you can order, you can order. Okay. okay, why don't you send us information and uh, Lorianne, uh, why don't you put your, your uh, email in the chat and then we can locate you later. Or the other thing is that actually, We'd love it if you would join us in CETA. That would be the easiest thing to do. Then we'd have your contact information. So just going back to our website, if you just fill out this uh, join, and that would apply to anybody else who might be watching this video later, you don't have to be teaching one of these languages right now. You just have to be someone who believes it's important for our, our, our region to offer opportunities for people who are interested to learn these languages. And they're definitely not limited uh, to just Russian by any means. And I'll share some things there. But if you just fill out this join page on that website, then we'll have your contact information. And we would love to connect up with with you or talk to your school people about why it would be a good idea and how to maybe approach it. Um, if you if there's concern about whether you have enough students who are interested, maybe you could accommodate some students from another district or something, you never know. Um, anyway, we'd love to engage with you about that. And what I wanted to just share again was, I showed this a little bit when Larissa was talking, this was an opportunity that came to us from uh, the Global Seal of Biliteracy. They had a couple of events this past year, Global YCRED, Youth Credentialing and Recognizing Excellence and Determination. Uh, this was a one day conference oriented to uh, people who are learning languages. They didn't have to be young students, but many of them were. And we were offered the opportunity to have uh, a full uh, eight hours, as it turned out, of content streaming during that day. But we, that was all recorded, and it is now all available by going to this this link that's on that page. And then you can find um, all of the things that we had in our section here. I think I've gotten into uh, French and other languages as well. But uh, this is um, that page will take you to the, where the videos are. And uh, just to give you an idea, these we have a resource document here that has resources for all these different languages. We don't have everything. We don't have Hungarian at the moment, and there's some other uh, uh, Baltic languages, for example, but we have some, and you can actually go and see the program and watch the things. So I think you would really enjoy the Russian presentations. This first one is super interesting. Marina Dunarovic was a heritage speaker. Uh, she was brought to the United States young, and then how she, she talks about how she kind of went back and got her language and graduated from the Slavic department. Larissa's story is in two parts. And Lari I'll just say that as a second language speaker of Russian, Larissa's language is so uh, beautiful and easy to understand. And the story is so engaging and she has visuals. And also, I just highly recommend it to anybody who's a Russian speaker. We were that's, also the, th that's the Leningrad are in here. The, I've always found that the people in St. Petersburg, Leningrad, um, the educated ones, I mean, their language is just so easy to really understand. Exquisite to I mean, understand. Amazing. 
Yeah. We also, I just want to point out, we had a wonderful contribution from two uh, Ukrainian Fulbrighters that are here, one at the University of Washington, Sofia Fedora, and then Kristina Petrov, and, and they had some great resources as well. We had Bulgarian represented, Estonian, and uh, Polish, and Ruthenian. Uh, well, this was all in Serbian, but it was a girl who was of Ruthenian background in Vojvodina. Uh, uh, Roseanne did a lot of outreach, and these are just wonderful, wonderful, some of them brief, uh, beautiful presentations. Alexei has an interesting thing on science fiction as well. Michelle, uh, yes. so this is a place where people can go and listen to those languages. I just wanted to point that out because yes. it's really yes. a pleasure if you know something of the language, just be able to go and hear uh, these right. things because they're all speaking in there heritage language. Yes, yeah. So that's a nice, I mean, many of them are native speakers, some of them are heritage speakers or younger, you know, newer ones. And then, you know, down in this section, you can actually go and there may be some resources that are helpful to you for uh, the learning of Russian. Obviously, you've got Middlebury, so that is a great resource. Um, I'm just trying to think of whether I have that. Well, here's Bilingual Art Studio. That is uh, Larissa's program. This is the grant we've referred to a couple of times that we're working on. Uh, that's okay. Russian, Romanian, Spanish, and now Ukrainian has been added as well. So wow. those are a few more resources. Um, so this was wonderful to have all of you here. I think in some ways we sort of span the the you know the 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 time period of the Cold War when many of us started learning Russian uh, because that was the opportunity that presented itself uh, and. And then more recent arrivals as changes in the Soviet Union to Russia happened with Larissa. And now, Lorianne, you're our future. And I think the <laughs> model of finding people that already have an endorsement in a language like Spanish and can potentially add a language like uh, Russian to the program is realistically, just like Vince had to be an ELL teacher and Larissa as well. Uh, we're going, I, nobody's going to probably give six periods or five periods of Russian right off the bat. You, you know, it has to be built out. But if we can get started, it would just mean the world to all of us. And I think you know, definitely uh, look to, um, you know, interest and support from the University of Washington and others. I think Vince, I mean, I think Russ had to leave, uh, but again, as I mentioned, he's the from the Language Learning Center. And if I could add, um, Lorianne, I like to say, I'm newly retired just last year. And at that time, I was very disappointed because I had the only K-12 Russian program in a public school. Mm -hmm. um, at this moment, to the best of our knowledge, and both Michelle and I try to keep up on that, where are we teaching Russian? There are no Russian programs in the state of Washington in a public school. In K-12, uh, right? No. In, in K-12. Now, I, I know that um, Pasco has their bilingual elementary school, um, if you want to count that. But, you know, I'm looking at it from my high school point of view. I also want to add that if you end up looking for textbooks, what you're going to find is they're all geared towards college. Mm -hmm. um, different timelines, different schedules. There's lots of great books out there. The one that I ended up using when we did a textbook adoption about seven or eight years ago is called Road to Russia. Mm -hmm. It's a softbound, but it's it's a pretty decent book and it's pretty contemporary, so. Okay, well, thank you so much. All of you have been very helpful. Um, I would, you know what I really love to just, go observe a class even now, just to, you know, the dynamic of the class. Um, so Larissa, do you, do you teach at the high school level or just always online or you're at the college? Uh, I'm not on a co college level, uh, but I do have some adult students. Um, the interesting thing will be probably for you to observe uh, right now in, the, in online program, I have two groups. So one is for, uh, advanced speakers and another for beginners. Okay. So if you want to observe the beginners, I think that will be more relevant for you if yeah. you start the program in a high school. So they okay. all are high schoolers and we actually, I'm using some of the uh, program that I mentioned to, but I'm adapting it to the younger audience and you can actually see how it works in um, um, during the lesson. It's every, every Friday we meet at 6.30 uh, uh, p.m. Pacific time. Okay, Friday. Awesome. And um, so to contact you, 
how do I contact you? To get the yeah, if you, I can connect you with emails if you want to put, I see that your email is in the, the chat right now. So I'm just going to copy that right over and keep it so that I can connect you and, uh, and Larissa. And before we all leave, let me just take a quick screen print here one moment. So um, let's all, we'll just, okay, everybody smile. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming, Lorianne. We will follow up, and hopefully this is the beginning of getting Russian back into some schools in Washington State and maybe beyond. It would be great. Yes. Thank you all so much. It's been very helpful. <laughs> great. Bye. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead. Nice and to see everyone. Thank you, and thank you, Michelle. You're like an octopus. Do you ever sleep? My goodness. <laughs> all the things you're keeping up with is just astonishing. Amazing. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Vince, for representing us on the Waffle Board. It means the world that every time people are talking about a conference or learning opportunities or anything, that we always get to hear this voice as well. It really does. And um, so uh, if, you're, if you're not a member yet of Waffle, Lorianne, please join. Oh, I am. I am. Okay, good. Excellent. Great. All right. Oh, I guess I can find you that way, too. Thank you again.